get the music. usual go into a little bit of what's going on in the world what's going on in regina which is where i currently am this is on location in regina something new to kind of experiment with we have a little bit of music for later but i guess to start out with how have you been john i'm getting over a cold so pretty well yeah there's definitely been a cold going around both in saskatoon and regina we recently just had a party and how many guests of the guests invited came down and I'd say at least four people were sick and couldn't attend out of maybe potential 15 or 20 people. Yeah, that I, I counted at least like four, def, definitely over four. But same thing with my workplace, same thing with other people's workplaces that I've talked to. It's, it's definitely going around. And thankfully, both of us are feeling well enough to participate today. And so it's interesting to, to experience where when enough people around you get sick. A lot of the systems in our lives start to like malfunction a little bit in that you kind of expect there's so many people working with you and then suddenly there's not. And so the for cashiers, for example, there may not be enough cashiers and there, there may not be enough people kind of my, my particular workplace, there wasn't enough instructors to go around. And so we start to experience this thing where we, we have to like make do without and Sometimes in the case of a cashier, it's not as much of a big deal. You just have to wait for a little while. In the case of other workplaces, you have to kind of adapt and do things a little bit more manually, perhaps. Uh, but we've been talking over the past couple of days of like how to, when we live our lives and we have, we kind of get used to having certain conveniences around us. And part of that is from other people kind of participating in our, our lives. But in, in many ways, our lives have been made more convenient over the years. And there's things that even, well, in Saskatchewan and, and elsewhere, we've like gotten used to certain things being around, certain technology being available to us and cheap. And it may, there may come a day where we may have to live without some of it. Well, uh, at the party last night, there was a couple that, uh, I mean, one of the people in the couple can remember the moon landing vaguely, at, in that, the first moon landing in 69. And they were about almost 10 years old and or no not even 10 years old and they remember a story or their their partner remembers a story about a kid uh, maybe was it a three-year-old uh deciding they're going to go to the bathroom for, by themselves for the first time and that involved walking up a hill at, at the place they were visiting to an outhouse and they come back running in terror yelling pig pig it's a pig 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 and like what what's going on here and there's no pigs here the closest pig is like two farms over there's definitely you didn't see a pig anyway two days later they find that there was a hog that had gotten loose and probably had terrified her in the dark or and on her way to the to the outhouse and she was actually for sure that she'd seen a pig there's actually in saskatchewan right now a wild pig uh, epidemic 
Yeah, I was and, reading about that. And there's a researcher at the U of S who's having trouble getting uh, uh, legislators to take serious action because, oh, well, it's, you know, in the wild, what, what big concern will it be? But they're wreaking havoc on livestock and, and on uh, farms and uh, breeding like, uh, <laughs> like pigs can. And um, if you don't have concerted eradication methods to destroy this invasive species, there's going to be millions of them. And their geographical range is roughly the geographical range of farms generally in Saskatchewan and across the prairie. So as and long it as it goes into the states, yeah. and the states is annoyed that we're not dealing with the issue because it will move south. And uh, they go all the way until up to the Atlantic provinces and stop about there. And you need to have a more than just issuing hunting licenses to kill these boars and other uh, wild pigs. You need to use methods like a Judas pig, which has no relation to Judas priest. So what is a Judas pig? A Judas pig apparently is a uh, betrayal pig. So you tag one pig that's part of a group and uh, you can then track it very precisely and it goes back and betrays the location of the rest of the pigs and then i don't know what if you swoop in with a gunship or what exactly right probably not that but you swoop in and you eradicate all of the pigs because if any of them get away they separate and and take off in different directions and then you can't get to them and they continue to reproduce. So this would be the sort of thing things. like the individual hunters would not be helpful for. Exactly. They would kill the, the they're Judas making pig. They're making the problem worse because yeah. they're breaking up the herds of the pigs and then you can't find them as easily and they are good at staying covered up. Their pigs are fairly intelligent uh, mammals so they can uh, outsmart dim-witted humans at times, mm -hmm. especially on a uh, terrain that they have better capabilities on. And like they can come at any time and raid the farms and raid the, the grains and stuff like that at the farms. Whereas it's hard to like constantly be on the watch for them, mm -hmm. as, at least my understanding. Also, I, I seem to remember from talking to Adam that they tend to be nocturnal creatures. So here in Saskatchewan, it's not legal to hunt using infrared equipment. And so that there's some kind of law preventing that from being an effective way to, to kind of dealing with them. But at the same token, as you say, like th this is probably at this point bigger than individual action. Individual action would go some extent of helping with this problem, but it really needs a legislative response at the collective level, uh, which our government is here in Saskatchewan not very good at those collective action problems. Yeah, um, often like the individual will try to do more and can do more than the government's doing in Saskatchewan. Yeah. For example, as I brought up before, I produce more solar power than three levels of government in Regina. And so, in the meanwhile, while we are kind of here, we do have a little bit of music this week. Uh, so, what? how would you describe this particular piece? Oh, well, this uh, one sure. is one I recognize from childhood, and it's actually from the 1920s, according to this record. And, and uh, uh, according to Wikipedia, both of the particular musicians involved died long before our current copyright re uh, regime would cover them. So hopefully Content ID will not flag this particular record and so shall I hit it? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Tiptoe through the window, by the window, anywhere I be, I'm tiptoeing through the tulip with me. From your pillow to the shadow, on the willow tree, and go through the tulip with me. Yeah. 
Bitcoin jokes aside, the there was something that came up this past week or so that I, I'm wondering. I didn't get a chance to talk to you about it, but I'm kind of wondering in retrospect about your kind of take on it, which is the Afghanistan Papers, which basically, at least in my understanding, was a Washington Post expose on the kind of backroom discussions of the Afghan War. And did you get a chance to read? anything about that at all? I only saw one portion that okay. someone shared. They were a journalist and they'd gone back and they were talking about how uh, well, I'm sort of mixing this up in the Twitter conversation about uh, maybe another situation where someone was asked to build a bridge for one of the sides and then the other side found out about the bridge and there was an arrangement worked out that you can finish building the bridge and get paid for it, but then we have to blow up the bridge. <laughs> and the same sort of thing was, whether that was the specific story in Afghanistan or whether it was an example, that's the sort of kind of corruption from both sides that was taking place during the Afghanistan war. For sure. Where the Americans didn't have anything to do but to blow up poor people's bridges. And, and build them again. And, and build them again the military, and get the money uh, to, to build building. it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was definitely going on. But just kind of remembering back to when the Afghan war was in its heyday, like in 2003, uh, when we were both still students, I seem to remember you were part of the opposition effort at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember as clearly back then. I know I was definitely skeptical of the war. I don't think I thought that there was any hope of doing much about it at the time but do you like what was your uh, memories from back then as far as uh did you i wrote about it on ebay forums and i mean many of those probably aren't still online i saved some of the writing i know on my blog my earliest blogs then like i started blogging in 2002 just using html and not accepting comments even there was halo scan that came along maybe 2004 or 5 that i was able to take comments on the website too and but like it, it seems and and maybe i could read deeper into the the actual uh what the post published and get maybe a, a better idea but my understanding so far at least from what i've read of people's accounts of what it was was just vindicating the anti-war narrative and all of the data points that they had were just saying what the the anti-war left in the states and elsewhere had been saying the whole time that it's not actually improving the quality of life outside of maybe the major centers that yes there are people who have been educated but the gains have been extremely limited and are going to be short-lived and basically we've we put all this effort towards fighting a contradictory war uh, that had no win condition at all and that at least they understood this while it was going on even though they were lying to the public about whether or not they believed it. Mm -hmm. And so, it, like even here in Canada, because Canada was and remains as, as part of the, the force in Afghanistan, right? That we were part of that, we were party to it. And so the lies were also lies to the Canadian public. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just interesting that there were voices at the time uh, that were critical of it against the, the basic idea of it and that they just weren't listened to. My perspective then that I recall was that the Russians had failed in the 70s to make lasting inroads. And the British before them. Mm -hmm. and, and so why would the Americans be any different? And, I mean, it played out exactly as we predicted. Exactly, yeah. And so the the purpose of it was just to make some money building blown-up bridges for the American military and throw some people into the, into the fray. And then ultimately it, it's part of the war for oil as well as the war on drugs. Drugs, yeah which the war on drugs was constructed specifically to be a reason to harass black people and anti-war protesters and Hispanic people yeah, in the U.S. That, that was also something that came up uh, yesterday as well, kind of the discussion of where this war on, on drugs came from and like how much has changed since then and how much we have reoriented our whole society 
both in Canada and in the United States, to just criminalize entire groups of people. Millions and millions of people have been locked up and their, their whole lives basically disrupted so that we could have this excuse to, to stop things like opposition to war, opposition to the Vietnam War. Most glaringly in Canada this past week, it was reported in The Guardian that the Wet'suwet'en in, uh, in uh, unceded territory in British Columbia, um, it's uh, obvious that the RCMP were prepared to start shooting innocent people that were simply protesting to protect their, their land. And, and this is not an exaggeration, by the way. Like that is pretty much literally, literally what the Guardian has reported, that they are willing to murder in cold blood to protect the revenues of the oil companies. The police are willing to murder in cold blood to protect these revenues and to protect this concept of a Canada that can just walk into unceded foreign territory that we just happen to be enveloping, that we just happen to have as an enclave within our borders that we don't even... I, I was surprised to see how big the unceded territory was in BC. They, they showed the map and it's huge. It's a big chunk in the middle of BC. And of all the maps I've ever seen, uh, minus like one, uh, in Canada, I've never seen a hole in the country that big present in the maps. Like if you go to you know, Barnes and Noble or Chapters or something, and you go get a globe, it's big enough that it should be on that actual globe of this unceded territory. But nobody bothers, or at least the government of Canada doesn't bother when it makes its maps to just even show the world that yes, we have this big chunk in the middle. That we have no agreement yeah. to occupy, and it, if it's bigger than Lake Winnipeg, yeah. and it, you show Lake Winnipeg on a map. You'd think then, you'd show that yeah. too, but for obvious political reasons, they don't. And they're willing to kill over it to maintain this illusion of control, which on the ground isn't, it, it isn't a full level of control, right? They have sovereignty there. They, they have something of a monopoly of violence. Uh, obviously, they would be tested if the RCMP actually started killing people in their area, but it is a, a nation in our borders. And yet that is who they have fully, at least in the internal documents, uh, expressed willingness to kill over. And uh, again, this the way the Guardian kind of wrote it up had to do a lot with C-51 and the, the particulars of the law that was put into place by the, the Harper government with the Trudeau Liberals' help. That maintains the government's ability to act in this violent way towards innocent people just defending their, their land. In the wake of this story, I went back to see what I wrote uh, when the news about uh, Profunk was released. Profunk being? Profunk is the uh, secret, top secret RCMP uh, involved strategy to deal with Soviet dissidents in Canada should the uh, Cold War have ended in a uh, strike and they needed to round up Soviet sympathizers as identified by the Canadian government and then intern them in Canada at places like the Regina Exhibition Park, where uh, the now current stadium is built. Hmm. So they were going to set up a prison camp there in the event of a um, breakdown in Canadian society, like in World War II when they interned uh, Japanese Canadians. And then prior to that, World War One interning Ukrainians or, or something in that range. Yeah. So it's, it's not like they haven't done it before. It's not like they have no experience in policy in doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I called it, the RCMP actually stands for really carefully monitoring people. <laughs> and, uh, or maybe really closely monitoring people. They're not very careful. They're just closely doing it. And they're monitoring everybody, as we know, mm -hmm. through sneaky means to evade the Canadian laws. And uh, that, I mean, WikiLeaks has revealed that, Snowden's revealed that. And uh, so we know that this is taking place uh, during Occupy and uh, eight years ago, it was really obvious there was not international coordination to try to deal with the protests uh, worldwide regarding uh, a standing up people standing up to the banks and the financial collapse of 2008, and where nobody really in the banks were punished for it. And uh, there was, uh, I don't forget if it was trillions or billions printed, and uh, Canadian banks were loaned money. We paid back our loans, made billions of dollars for, or was it millions, sorry, we made a lot of money. The Canadian banks like TD and Royal made money off of American taxpayers because they devalued their currency to give money to Canadian banks to loan out to companies 
which then paid back their loans and the Canadian banks paid back the United States, but not with interest, mm -hmm. of course. So then now their currency is worth less. Well, we may, uh, at our banks made millions of dollars. Plus on top of that, there was like a whole generation of infrastructure spending that didn't happen because it was excused by, oh, we had to, or at least in the States, you know, we had to build mm -hmm. the banks. And now they don't have proper uh, transit systems in San Francisco and in New York and elsewhere where they're complaining about overcrowding. When I was in uh, New York in o October, the subways were fairly functional, although there was a time or two at rush hour where we couldn't get on a train for at least two or three trains. And kind of in addition to that, one, the U.S. keeps getting more and more in debt, whether or not to China specifically, China remains a, a large holder of U.S. debt. And two, a lot of the production of basic goods is happening in China. And so we're, we're getting to a point where, like, in part because of the choices of where to spend that money during the 2008 crisis, the production of goods for the world has migrated quicker than perhaps it had to to China and areas under the influence of the government of China. And one of the kind of key questions is how do we deal with a world now where China, or at least the government of China, has the, their kind of thumb on who is allowed to produce and who is not? And things like the Belt Road Initiative, things like they're choosing to, in places like Australia, where they put pressure on the university to keep students from having certain opinions expressed, from keeping faculty from having certain opinions expressed. They're, they're taking a much more active role than you might imagine in terms of making sure global opinion moves in a certain direction. More active than the Canadian energy war room? Hard to compare those two. For those who are not aware of what that is all about, the government of Alberta has recently uh, put, I think it was $30 million? Per, per year. Per year, and that's from the carbon tax? No, well, I don't... Some of it. I mean, who knows, really? Yeah, <laughs> true, true enough. To a propaganda mill, uh, similar to Russian groups that kind of have done the same thing for, for example, the 2016 election. And we'll spend that $30 million per year on trolling people on Twitter and Facebook and other social media. And in newspapers. And in newspapers. To they went after a journalist at the Medicine Hat newspaper who wrote a critical column. He's a reporter and a columnist because it's a small newspaper. He's got to fulfill two roles. So he does reporting on one section of the paper and then does a column uh, elsewise. And he said that the uh, war room was an obvious uh, propaganda mill using different words. And they uh, lashed back and said, like, we hear, here's our response. We uh, expect you to print it and not even, you know, offering to pay to get it printed. Mm -hmm. And they get, like, we should run this as an op-ed <laughs> instead of, like, a letter to the editor. Right. And, and you know, a little presumptuous of them. And then all the meanwhile, they were busy uh, operating with a stolen trademark logo that they probably bought off of Fiverr for a few bucks. Or if they hadn't, then the firm that they'd uh, contracted had done that because someone on Fiverr was selling an almost identical logo, which had been ripped off of Progress Site Infinity. And it's, it, you can find it on other firms that have basically the same trademark. And so, like, on one hand, it's a good thing that they're still incompetent enough that they're making these basic mistakes with trademark law and probably basic factual errors too, both intentional and otherwise. But with a $30 million a year budget and a long enough time frame to practice, like they're, at least as I understand it, their modus operandi is to identify people who are critical of the oil industry all over Canada, possibly outside of Canada, and then like focus on discrediting them, focus on getting attention away from them, from disrupting them, and then kind of going from there. But $30 million a year is a lot of money to do that sort of thing. And given we know how effective the Russians have been at it, the Albertans, they're cl culturally closer to the rest of Canada. So it stands to reason that they'll have a lot of success in misleading people about the oil industry and climate change. Well, imagine having an office of 30 people to work on something. That's yeah. huge. And you're paying those people a million dollars each a year. So obviously they've got more than 30 people working on this. Yeah. And that's, I don't know, in Western Canada, especially in Saskatchewan, an office of 30 people is fairly significant and you can get a lot of work done. So imagine how awful it will be when the work they're doing is uh, trolling and uh, propaganda making. And there's two other things going on there. One is that if you look at the amount of budget that they've cut for education in Alberta, basic education and like reducing 
can't remember the full details of, as far as whether it's reducing pay or like just like keeping the pay of teachers the same or whatever but it's proportional so like they're taking money from their basic education of children and then putting it into miseducation and active misleading of the public which is kind of a terrible thing on its own but in addition to that i think like it this is almost certainly going to be used in election seasons in canada both at the provincial level not just in Alberta, but all over Canada, because there are very strict limits on what political or what money can be spent during election times by who. And this is just like a, a huge slush fund waiting to happen for the next election somewhere for conservatives to get a, an advantage from. Well, the Canadian Energy um, Center, Canadian Energy Center, or also known as the Alberta War Room, uh, there's several great parodies of it on Twitter. And I'm mixing up the name, yeah, it's officially known as the Canadian Energy Center. It's a publicly funded, but a private corporation. Hmm. So they're exempt from Freedom of Information Act. So the journalists can't really dig into it. The people working there, five of them are former post media journalists. And uh, there's a, they, they hired a firm that's incompetent in finding them a, a logo. And I don't think. Uh, they're going to be able to, the journalists are going to be able to consistently prove to people that the the center is not informing people correctly. Like they're going to end up arguing over the facts presented by the center and then the facts presented by scientists mm -hmm. and people are going to think that there's an actual debate. Right. When Whereas it's it, manufactured. There is, no de there is no debate between 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yeah. But then when you have some idiot come along, oh, well, I think 2 plus 2 equals 3 and that's the way I see it. And then you do you, how much time do you spend debating this with, with an idiot? Well, and, and not just an idiot, but like an active mis person who's misleading you. Mm -hmm. Like someone who is actively claiming to be a journalist, even though they're not actually a journalist, specifically to, to cause doubt in, in the eyes of their audience of who is the legitimate journalist, right? Mm -hmm. And like the, the amount of bad faith involved in this war room is just unreal. And it's barely gotten started. Like have they even started really... Like they've got the logo now. But yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah, they fixed their logo after three days yeah. of knowing that it was stolen. They finally took it down, put up the other one that they made, and they. Uh, I mean, who knows what they also they've been doing behind the scenes? There's exactly. Like Matt Wolf and the Premier's inner circle is sort of overseeing this issues management civil servant. He's making two hundred thousand a year, and he's just trolling people on Twitter is his job. Which, I mean, like, as far as, I mean, good for him for getting a job paying $200,000, just, you know, screwing around on Twitter. I definitely know people who would love that position. But even so, like, what is the value to society of paying this guy to do nothing but tweet? Especially, like, right now there's a bit of an opposition, as you mentioned. There's a couple of parody accounts and, and groups that are trolling the trolls and trying to, like, bring out and annoy them. But, like, they don't have a budget. They're just people out of their own free will taking the time out of their lives to try to do something in the public sphere about this problem of this, this group. But because they don't have a budget, it's going to be hard in the long term to compete. And this, this could be a very successful thing on the, on the part of the Albertan government. To that say. reminds me, as far as success, uh, how much of this money will end up going into campaigns across the country? I mean, they're branding themselves as the Canadian Energy Centre. So let's say uh, in New Brunswick, a uh, opposition party com is seeming to make gains and they're looking like they might defeat the incumbent. And they're talking about reducing the influence of the Irvings on New Brunswick politics. Well, then suddenly the Canadian Energy Centre with uh, millions of dollars could maybe swoop in and carpet bomb uh, New Brunswick with uh, advertising saying, well, we can't have a carbon tax. We can't think about doing anything against the Irvings. And will that be subject to New Brunswick election laws? Maybe not, because it's coming from a government entity instead of a private entity. Although the Canadian Energy Centre is a private entity, but it's government funded. So, I mean, is this a, just a clever conservative uh, money laundering scheme like in and out Yeah. So for, for the audience who isn't aware of the in and out uh, you were one of the people who really followed that closely. What was the in and out scandal? Well, now that it took place in 2006, I don't remember too many particulars, but the okay. gist of it is that the federal party 
was laundering money the through Party. the Federal Conservative Party was laundering money through other local campaigns, sending money back, and then they could spend more on advertising than they were legally allowed to. And they settled with Elections Canada afterwards so, with an agreement that they wouldn't do it again, basically, and maybe had to pay some money. Right. So th this wasn't just like a speculation thing that, oh, you know, we suspect that they're doing it and we can't prove. No, but this was proven. Elections Canada caught them. They knew that they were doing. It was knowingly done. And like you said, they, they settled and they promised not to do it again. And yet we get stuff like the poster or the billboard here in Regina where the provincial party west watch or something yeah like funded the poster that well, was clearly three rich individuals one of them sas party's biggest individual donor went after goodale mm -hmm. and with a billboard campaign among other things helped knock goodale out of his seat in regina Wascana. yeah so like this this was a successful initiative but on their part like they the money actually did speak in this case and so we can expect that this $30 million a year is going to have an effect on the rest of Canada. Now, as far as dealing with this goes, like we could probably make sure that as time goes on, that when we see our friends and family sharing anything f directly from this group, that it's caught and tagged and that we point out that, oh, hey, this is a obvious troll group, an obvious plant or whatever. But it seems like that isn't even the, the big threat. That the big threat is the threat to the narrative itself and that our ability to control our narrative or at least detect when our the narratives are are stemming from this group that it might there's room for somebody out there not necessarily everyone taking the time out of their life to do this to, but for one person to just track to see what narratives are being spread from this group and can we like list them or can is there a way to like organize i'm thinking kind of like a snopes thing I think there isn't any way to do it unless you have a budget of at least a million dollars a year. Exactly. Like, we're, we're <laughs> at a loss for yeah, that. Yeah, you got to fight it with uh, staff time. And so that means paying a couple of people that, you know, track the, uh, the doings of over 30 people, constantly contacting uh, newspapers and p individuals to threaten them mm -hmm. and send them misleading stuff like the Fraser Institute and the uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation does. Oh, so we were we were speaking a, a little bit earlier about the Fix uh, Canada book, which is it's a terrible book on so many levels. Uh, but the guy who wrote it, it was a former Canadian Taxpayer Federation guy. Like that was his background, and what one of the things he consistently bragged of throughout the book, often in very repetitive ways, like he was copying and pasting almost. But it's just like telling that that's the level of. I guess the, the level of thinking of in this era, I guess, where you have... I guess we talked a little bit about that book earlier, so I'm not going to lend too much more to it, but just wanted to like clarify that those two groups are the same. It's like the, that, the followers of that group, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, you may as well treat it as one entity. So something to think about anyway. I'm going to talk about China for a minute, I think. Too. Yeah. So right now, at least last I heard, that there are still protests going on in Hong Kong. And there's still resistance being made to China having the ability to extradite people from Hong Kong specifically. But not just Hong Kong, but other uh, countries in Asia. Uh, the people in those countries are looking to see what happens in Hong Kong. Because if they're allowed to, to gain that level of authority there, it's going to be in places... Well, it's, they've already got the ability to extradite in places like Vietnam. But they're going to spread how much control they have over these kind of satellite countries, including countries like Australia, and I would suggest Canada. And that one thing we're missing is this extradition agreement with China that we've given, we have trade agreements with China, like the FIPA that Harper signed, that give them an obscene amount of control over our economy, what, things like what our government can say about the government of China and, and its impact on our country. And so, did you want to... Well, I'm concerned about the RCMP's internal documents showing that they're willing to shoot peaceful people. And so you know, the police force that deranged or uh, lacking morals, they're not going to stand up for Canadians if China comes knocking and wants people. Right. And it, like you say, if they're willing to kill us for peacefully protesting, what's stopping them from killing us for peacefully protesting Chinese interference with our, our government at this point? I mean, granted, we've, we've kind of got enough problems to worry about it as is, but they, they're flexing their muscles right now. And there's, I think there's a danger in allowing 
the opposition to the government of China's interference in the Pacific Rim generally to be exclusive to the Trump administration. And the particular people I talked to on the who were basically from the perspective of those other a Asian satellite countries were seeing Trump in a positive light because he was willing to stand up to, to the government of China and their particular impacts. But I don't think it should be, I don't, I don't even want to call it like the high ground, but it's like something that can give credibility to Trump, if that's even possible. But like, did you see the same kind of thing where like the, is this something that people who are not Trumpists can kind of benefit from uh, in, in terms of thinking about this, this problem and coming up with a, a response that isn't just, oh, let's let's go to war or let's have a trade war or whatever. Well, I'm, uh, I think it's, it's incredibly complicated to deal with human rights abuses in China. It's so complicated, like, we, I don't know where to begin to talk about it. I think about how Canada turned away refugees from Germany, Jewish refugees, mm -hmm. and sent them back to their deaths, some of them, uh, before World War II. And there were concentration camps, of course, designed to exterminate people in Germany. And now there are concentration camps not necessarily directly designed to, right now to ex exterminate and be death camps for people in the United States uh, who are trying to flee there from worse countries in Central America. And there are concentration camps in China, we know right now. Mm -hmm and there's abuse of uh, gay people in uh, Russia. And we have important trading with most of these places. So how do you even begin to talk about extracting Canada from these dependencies on countries that are don't share our human rights values mm -hmm. and or not even our objectives? Although with our police force willing to murder peaceful protesters, maybe we don't have as much superiority over the Chinese as we'd like to think. But yeah, those, those, that gap is definitely narrowing with time, I'm finding. But as far as specifically China, like there, there are steps that can be taken locally, like not buying slave-produced things from Walmart, for example, uh, that we can do. But again, we've, we've kind of forgotten as a culture to live without certain conveniences. And as time goes on, we get more and more and more dependent on these institutions that again are more and more dependent on things like uh, authoritarian governments with control over the mass production systems. Mm -hmm. So it, it, well, one person not doing something is, is nice and it can inspire a movement as uh, Greta Thunberg has shown, mm -hmm. but then there are lots of cases where one person not doing anything is literally a drop in the bucket. Right. And it just means one person not doing anything with no influence on anybody else. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that until you try. So people should still try to do the right thing. But if we don't have, at some level, governments doing what people collectively want to have done, we're going to have the wrong thing done on an industrial scale. Right, and which is kind of where we are today. In every aspect of our lives. And, and it's difficult for individuals to stand up and change, too, because they face peer pressure at work. They face peer pressure at home from friends and peers and from family members including spouses or children, like say you wanted to stop using gasoline tomorrow directly. So then you aren't driving, but then the kids are going to want to be driven to school or they need to be driven to daycare or they want to be driven to a sporting event or to a birthday party and they can't get to these social events that they've planned. So their whole social structure of their lives has to change. And, and like, even if you manage to get past that point, I'm finding there's another layer on top of that where like, I don't own a vehicle. I am totally fine navigating through Saskatoon on my bike or on foot and getting from social event to social event. But there has been cases, including today, where I'll be with one group and then another group, or, or there'll be like basically two things going on. And there'll be another person who wants to travel with me. And even though I'm the person who's directing where travel happens, it winds up being more convenient to just get a ride. And I'll, I'll totally admit that I got a ride today. I got a ride here. And it just, it, it's more difficult to convince that second person almost than to do, to get from place to place on your own. And even if the second person is the type of person who would actually bike or, or, or walk on their own, just the fact that two people go together, you can't, well, I mean, some people ride two to a bike, but most of the time, again, it's more convenient to, to ride two to a car. And so that that's what 
it winds up going kind of happening instead. Yeah, right now bikes aren't very versatile in the multiple people sense. Yeah. If they're plentiful enough and the people are physically capable, then they can come along with you. Like I've biked with my kids around a fair bit mm -hmm. in the last year or so. They've opted to be one of them's opted to be more independent and bike on his own when he goes biking. The other one prefers to stay home and play video games, and I usually bike by myself where I'm going. And but when they were younger, we all three of us go um, together to some place, especially if the car was used by my spouse. So mm -hmm. then it just makes sense to to bike because otherwise we're staying home. In the meanwhile, we are kind of getting to the end of the, the show here. So uh, is there anything kind of on the top of your head that you want to tell the world? I know that the issue of how do we deal with China seems to be a little bit bigger than this show specifically. I'm sure we'll go into that more in detail later. But. Well, like, yeah, how are we even going to stop buying things from China? And will there be a trade war? I think there could be a trade war very easily. Like, we are kind of party to the U.S. trade war, unfortunately. That seems to have stopped escalating momentarily. We'll see how that continues as the kind of impeachment, quote-unquote, continues. Or, or doesn't continue as the case may be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's clearly a corrupt jury in the Senate, and they've openly stated they'll be corrupt and not be fair jurors. So then Pelosi is totally justified, I think, in holding back, uh, transferring it to the Senate, and just leave the impeachment hanging over Trump. That During any, the election. At any point, you could be impeached in the Senate. Oh, so speaking of uh, that, there was something that came up last night. I do want to like mention it, because I'm sure not a lot of people have heard of it. But the, there was the, the talk about the third term possibility. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of describe well, that? For the... Yeah, so somebody uh, theorized that if Trump's current term is interrupted by an impeachment, does it count as a full first term? And then if a U.S. president is limited to two terms, is, two full terms, two full terms, is he then limited uh, no more because he hasn't had a full term? It was interrupted by an impeachment. So that wasn't tested in Bill Clinton's case because the Democrats lost fair and square, actually not fair and square at all, to uh, George Bush. Oh, George the, during George the 2000 Bush, election, where, yeah. Where the election was stolen. But in any case, they had Gore and, and Clinton didn't plan to run again anyway. But now Trump, if he's, you know, as corrupt as everybody knows he is, he'll, if he wins next time, will he And just egotistical decide, enough to just, run. He'll second. offer to run again in 2024. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then the Republicans obviously will say, sure, obviously you're, you're capable of winning and you can do whatever you want. So why not break the Constitution that way, too? Well, I mean, in this case, would it, it may not be breaking the Constitution. It might be bending it a little bit. Yeah. But there, there's this... It just, would depend on the wording. Yeah. The well, obvious intention would be broken. The lawsuit is definitely coming. And we're going to see if that check and balance still holds. But it does make me wonder if uh, they hold back transferring the impeachment to the Senate and Trump wins in the election, but the Democrats then take the Senate, can <laughs> they transfer the impeachment at that point? Or do they just need to re-impeach him on different charges, which would be fairly easy, and then, you know, impeach him at that point? But then removing them after the Senate has found them guilty, is it in effect as soon as they vote? Or is there another process after that? Like, will there be a, there can't be an appeal to the Supreme Court, I'd imagine. But they, the Republicans would pull out any stop at that point yeah. if Trump hasn't aged out in some morbid way or otherwise decided to give up. Definitely things that will be exciting as we go through American politics. But other than that, though, is there anything else you wanted to mention to the world now that we have you? Well, Regina's just joined the uh, supercharger Tesla electric vehicle network, and it's now cross-country. So people with Teslas uh, can now travel in Canada instead of having to hop down to the U.S. to get across the continent. And that's uh, every 200 quickly, kilometers, right? Roughly every 200 kilometers. And their vehicles tend to go in the wintertime even uh, at least 400 kilometers. So pretty easy. They can charge up again after 20 minutes. There's the, the best superchargers in the world available right now on the prairies. Hmm. Right on. All right. Well, thank you, those of you out there who are still uh, watching or listening. And we, as usual, if you enjoy this, uh, please consider joining on subscriberstar.com slash jeff-cliff and joining the Regina Car Share if you are in Regina. Uh, it is the one of the best ways to get around Regina. And other than that, I will see you all next week. Bye now. Bye. Goodbye.
goodbye now. Goodbye. I thought the pardon was the time. I spent the evening forgetting the time. I can't deny. Oh, now goodbye. Goodbye now. Goodbye. Goodbye now. Goodbye. The trip by taxi was far. We'd linger longer if I had a car. There's one advantage to all leaving. It brings about a special gift. I hope that there's eternally a momentary party just a second. And we're starting. Oh, goodbye now. Goodbye now. It's just a moment we're apart.